Okay, this one's take four on this topic right here. All right, so I won't bore you with the awful details of what happened the first three times I tried to make this one. Uh, but it is Saturday night. This is my Saturday night trying to make a, a, a lecture recording here. Um, okay, last time, you know, we talked about lots and lots of free expression cases. Uh, and then, uh, then the, the different amendments, what, four, fifth, what was it? Fifth, sixth, eighth, and fourteenth, you know, the, the different cases there. All right, so, uh, and we start off with the right to privacy cases. Um, so now we're looking at something called selective incorporation, which really we've been looking at the whole time. Uh, and I should have, uh. I should have started out, you know, my, my plan is next year, maybe. I'll just start out with uh, this heading before I get into prayer in school. Uh, but Barron versus Baltimore is a case, the facts of which I don't really remember. Uh, but it's important because in the case, the court ruled, the Supreme Court ruled that the Bill of Rights doesn't apply to the states. It only limits the power of the national government. It's irrelevant to state governments. States can decide if they want to have their own bills of rights, but the, the Bill of Rights of the Constitution does not limit the power of state governments. Um, but in the 20th century, uh, the court have kind of gradually changed their minds. Not changed their minds, but they have incorporated certain of these amendments to apply to the states. Uh, the third doesn't apply still, and I believe the seventh still doesn't apply. Uh, the second is the most recent one to be incorporated, and we'll see how that has worked this lecture. Um, but um, in the 20s and 30s, it was uh, free expression cases, and then the 60s, due process cases like Gideon uh, and Miranda, you know, rights of the accused kind of cases. All right, uh, so the government's got to make a balancing act. It's got to balance individual rights against the public interest. Um, so, I mean, we just know that so well right now. We're, we're sick to death. I don't know if you're like me, but I'm sick to death of sitting at home all the time. Uh, and sick to death of social distancing and the whole thing. And yet, you know, we got to do it. You know, we got to do it. The public, you know, what we're trying to do is slow this, you know, the spread of this down. So, you know, minimize the number of people going to get it. We don't want to get it. Uh, but, you know, it's a curtailment on the individual rights there. All right, individual liberties. All right, and in the places, you know, in the places where it's really bad, New York City, you know, uh, New Orleans and so forth, I mean, the local governments are, you know, they're quarantining everybody, was really, uh, you know, cutting down, curtailing individual liberties because of the public interest. All right, um, you know, uh, another example, that's World War II, where the Japanese Americans were sent to the internment camps. Uh, obviously, their civil liberties were being violated, but, you know, they were seen as threats to national security. Okay, uh, we are very aware uh, that minorities are concerned about racial profiling by the police. Uh, Black Lives Matter kind of comes out of uh, these issues. Um, I'm going back to the 90s. I just miss the politics of the 90s so very much. Uh, in certain ways, uh, and um, so we go back to O.J. here. So, you know, we know the O.J. story. Well, when he finally turned himself in, there's Time magazine, there's Newsweek magazine. It's the same picture. Well, what Time do? Uh, this is supposed to be a centrist magazine. They darkened him to make him look more menacing. Um, so there's, uh, there's the... Uh, you know, there's that issue. Uh, this is a um, it's a study done at a college, and college students were asked which person looks more like a criminal, uh, and you know the the number said this guy looked more like a criminal. All right, well, given that you've just seen the OJ pictures here, you can probably guess this is the same person, uh, but the darker version of him looks more like a criminal to uh, the college kids. All right, uh, so, I mean, just kind of this issue of racial profiling. Um, 
because of this and because crime's gotten a little better, it's gotten a lot better uh, in recent years, uh, and awareness has been raised about this, that's part of the reason why Kim Kardashian's had success lobbying uh, President Trump concerning minorities who've been put in prison for a long time, going back to this period, going back to the 90s. Um, there's a concern that the war on drugs imposes unfair sentence on minorities. My son Zach got me to watch on Netflix. Probably still on there. You know, if you're looking for something good to watch, it's called uh, 13th. And it's arguing that the prison sentence, pr prison system is kind of just another version of... Um, I think it's called 13th, of slavery. So, I mean, third, so, so I, mean, I guess it's saying the 13th Amendment didn't really end slavery. Something like that. Uh, yeah, because there there's a part of the 13th Amendment that says you can't enslave people unless and make them work without pay unless they committed a crime or something like that. So it's like the 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 get out of it clause was was the case that the uh that the film was making. All right, um, but I don't know if you know this person. You can't really see her very well. Kind of reminds me of Kim Kardashian in a lot of ways. Uh, an earlier version of Kim Kardashian before Kardashian became the lobbyist. Uh, and that's Paris Hilton, uh, and she was uh, convicted of possession of powder coca cocaine, and she served like two days in jail. Um, and so the, but it's powder cocaine. So if you look at how much powder cocaine it takes to get, I wonder how much, maybe five years in prison, something like that, as opposed to crack cocaine, it's literally 500 times as much. So crack cocaine is poor people's drugs, powder cocaine is rich people's drugs. Uh, so the war on drugs, you know, uh, is seen as imposing an unfair sentences on minorities uh, sometimes. Okay, so we stop right there. I'm going to do one more. I'm going to stop it. You know, I've got all these theories about what to make this work better. I don't know if anything will, but I'm going to I'm going to stop it, make the video, and send you the first two headings, and then make the video and send you the next two headings. Okay, so this one's interesting. Uh, so racial profiling for Arabs start after 9/11, especially at airports. Um, and so, I mean, you've got, you know, a political cartoon where people in Middle Eastern outfits are concerned about their civil liberties. And then, you know, the, the plane's going to hit the airport there. So, I mean, it's pretty conservative uh, political cartoon on civil liberties. Uh, here you got this picture right here. Now, there's 10 prisoners at Guantanamo in this picture. None of them have had a trial. So, here's my question to you. How many of, you, how many of them do you think are innocent? So let's say hypothetically that five of them are innocent uh, and the other five are guilty. So are you willing to keep five innocent people at Guantanamo in order to keep the five guilty people at Guantanamo? And see, the deal is, you know, the Bush uh, administration designated them as enemy combatants. The concern is there's not enough evidence against them. If they had a trial, they get found not guilty. Maybe they confess and it's a coerced confessing, waterboarding, something like that. Uh, so the evidence will get thrown out. Uh, so you have somebody that you think is probably guilty, but there's not enough evidence to convict them. You let them out, they're going to commit, commit a terrorist act. All right, so back to my ratio. Let's say that, uh, I don't know, three of them are innocent. In order to uh, keep the seven guilty people from going free, are you willing to keep three innocent people uh, in prison? Well, let's say one's innocent. All right, and by the way, this is from the book of uh, Genesis when uh, Abraham is talking to God about uh, how many decent people it's going to take in the city of Sodom for him not to uh, destroy the city. So, I mean, I'm kind of borrowing that uh, dialogue there. Uh, but none of these people have had a trial, so we don't know if they're guilty or not. Okay, uh, the Patriot Act uh, is when, hey, they started listening to us. First, it was the government. You know, we've had a discussion in class back in the fall about how we can be talking about something, then we look at our phone and somebody's sending us, us an ad for that something. So corporations are listening to us. Uh, the government started listening to, to people 
um, after the Patriot Act was passed. Uh, and the concern was it's listening to people that are not suspected of terrorist activity as well. You know, somebody could have the same name as a suspected terrorist, uh, or um, they might be taking a college class on terrorism. There's any number of ways that somebody could get on the terror watch list without having any real connection to terrorism. All right, the travel ban, you know, we're aware of that, you know, and it's just kind of that, again, it's that balance between the individual liberties of those people uh, and the administration's concern for preventing terrorism uh, from coming and more recently, you know, the virus. Okay, uh, look at there, here's the last one. So, all right, so getting this one done, am I not? Like in, you know, probably 15 minutes or so. All right, so the exclusionary rule says illegally obtained evidence can't be used in court. If you've ever watched the Law and Order shows, uh, and Law and Order was on for, I don't know, maybe 20 years, uh, and the chief, the, the top detective in Law and Order was Lenny, uh, and he was, you know, so it starts, Law and Order started like in the 90s when crime was real high, and Lenny's forever concerned that the bad guys are getting away with it and that he doesn't have enough evidence against them. Um... And so he, he cuts corners and he kind of cheats to get the evidence. And then halfway through the show, here comes the defense attorney with uh, the motion to suppress because they feel like, you know, the evidence against their client was illegally obtained. All right, so exclusionary rule says you can't use illegally obtained evidence in court. You know, you, you torture somebody, you can't use their confession. All right, so our court case on this one is Matt versus Ohio. Um... I think her name, I don't think I misspelled her name. I don't think her name was Dolly Mapp. I think it was Dolly Mapp. Uh, and it, I think it was in the 60s. And so the police were looking for something. Let's say they were looking for, I think they were looking for drugs uh, at her house. And then they found illegal porn. Right? We talked about obscenity last time, right? Uh, so they found something else. In other words, they were looking for A. They had a, uh, they had a warrant to look for A. They found B, which they didn't have a warrant for, and they arrested her for B. All right, well, the, the Supreme Court ruled that they couldn't use the evidence that they found against her because they didn't have a warrant for that evidence. And so that exclusionary rule is kind of, so, I mean, so uh, illegally obtained evidence is excluded. Uh, and uh, it's controversial because people argue that, you know, conservatives have argued and made it uh, difficult for our police to do their job. All right, um, so that second question right there is an interesting one. Third question, I don't know that we really covered that one. Did we? All right, and then let's go right here. No, 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 I'll, I'll wait, I'll wait. All right, stay tuned, the second take.